Good morning. And uh, welcome back as we continue on the footsteps of Paul. Before we start, let us go with it one second. Uh, before we start, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Most High God, we thank you once again for gathering us this morning. We thank you for bringing us thus far. And as we continue, Lord, uh, along Paul's journey, help us to uh, notice the things that we ought to emulate, the things that we ought to avoid. Help us to give thanks for the wonderful things you have done in the life of Paul and the early church. And uh, even, Lord, help us to be that kind of church that brings glory to your name. We commit this time and everyone here into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you recall, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, Ephesus. And we know that Paul spent about three years in Ephesus. And uh, we talked a lot about the architecture. We talked a lot about the history of Ephesus, how Paul uh, would have entered Ephesus uh, through the gate near the upper marketplace. And he would have reconnected with uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and uh, of course he would meet a group of 12 uh, disciples who, like Apollos, uh, would not have heard about uh, the Holy Spirit, and so they would only have been acquainted with the baptism of John the Baptist, so many people suppose that these 12 disciples, because of that, uh, were probably disciples of none other than Apollos himself. And, of course, uh, they were trained uh, in the, the, of course, well, I say trained, but they were given an update, all right, a very, very important update on, uh, basically, the gospel itself. And these 12 men uh, became the foundation of the Ephesian church. Now, uh, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 8, and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were hardened and believed not, but speak evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus, and this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks." Uh, so we find uh, that Paul, as per usual, uh, he would go into the synagogue and he would deal uh, with the Jews, given their background uh, in, uh, in the scriptures. And uh, we notice that uh, he was involved in disputing and disputing and persuading. Uh, it is very important, you know, I, I, I believe in the importance of apologetics. I think uh, there is a great need uh, for us to defend uh, the scriptures, there is a great need for us to show the differences between uh, the gospel uh, as compared to other, uh, you know, manners of philosophy, different religions, and so on. Uh, what is different about Christianity? Thank you. What is different about Christianity as opposed to these things? Now, we do not hope to convert people by means of our disputing and persuading. Uh, the gospel is a, oh well, salvation is a work that is wrought uh, by the Holy Spirit and it is God that saves. Uh, but nevertheless, we know that the Holy Spirit uh, has a very great work. In fact, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit is convicting the uh, heart of the individual. Uh, but that does not mean we can be lazy in our preparations with regard to sharing the gospel. Now, I don't mean that all of us should become theologians. Uh, but I think there has to be a, uh, the ability, first of all, uh, to be able to study the Word of God as it is, and also uh, to be able to dispute with the modern uh, philosophies and modern thoughts of this world. Uh, but of course, even then, we find uh, that there were some hearts that were hardened and believed not, and spoke evil of that way. And uh, of course, uh, you know, we find that Paul... Uh, was separated and uh, from them, disputing daily in the day of, in the uh, school of Tyrannus. I think I spoke about this um, before, that uh, he found the perfect spot for his ministry by renting out a lecture hall. Now we don't know whether he rented out or they gave it to him or whatever, but he kind of used a lecture hall that belonged uh, to a man by the name of Tyrannus. And uh, like I said uh, the last time, the 
usual schedule would be that they would use it from about 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, every day. Uh, so normally the, the folks that would use the place, they would rest from noon uh, to avoid the, uh, the heat of the day. And uh, during this time, uh, you can imagine Paul working with tents in the morning, and while everyone is having their siesta or their afternoon nap, uh, Paul will go about the work of God. And uh, we find that earnest desire, and of course for a period of about two years, uh, you find that Paul ran his own Bible college, uh, which is why it is very important as a church that we have a Bible institute, uh, that we have a, a place for us to train people uh, for the ministry. Uh, you know, one of the jobs of the church, I mean, of course, we, we ought to win souls, we ought to uh, feed the flock and so on, preach the Word of God. But one of the jobs of the church is to raise up people uh, for the work of Christ. We cannot outsource uh, that job. Uh, when you outsource that job, you find that uh, you run into many problems, many uh, you know, false teachings, you know, many complications and confusions. And ideally, in fact, I would say necessarily, uh, it is the church that is supposed to be involved directly with the teaching and training up uh, of men for the work of the gospel. Now, we continue this morning uh, with the uh, what happened so far. Now, two years Paul taught in this lecture hall, establishing a gospel ministry that extended into other cities of Asia Minor, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And so you find that the uh, goal of, the, of, of any mission work is really for people uh, to hear the gospel. The other day I was talking to uh, Pastor Vinay, you probably met him the last time he was here, and we were talking about uh, the work that was going on in India, and he was telling me about how there are a lot of uh, unsaved pastors. Man, what an oxymoron, all right? I was uh, giggling a little bit, but he was telling me that there are a lot of these men uh, that are not truly saved, but they go to Christ and ask for some petition that God would bless them with, uh, you know, uh, this or that. And when they get their blessings, they consider themselves Christians, and they try to sort of build a following, uh, and very often, uh, these folks are not actually saved. And so in order to get them to be, uh, to get them saved, they would invite these villagers from all these very distant villages, about six, seven hours drive away, uh, to come uh, to the city. But the problem with that is that you've got to pay their transportation fee, and you've got to pay their food, and you've got to also give them like a daily uh, stipend and so on. And so the difficulty he was discussing with me is trying to figure out uh, who is genuine and who is not, uh, who is coming in for the blessing of the free ride and who is not. And uh, when uh, Pastor Corey Mears, who is now very much involved in the work there as well, went to visit, uh, this was the issue they faced. And one of the things I discussed with him was that uh, at the end of the day, it's impossible to see a person's heart. But I think as long as once or twice the message gets across, you've done your job. At the end of the day, that's all you can do. So I told him, I mean, if you were to ask me, I would say you invite them one time, maybe two times, but the first time they don't understand. After that, I would think the job's done, go on to the next group. <laughs> and uh, if they respond, they respond. I'm not saying that everyone responds after two times, but we want to get the gospel message out to as many people as we possibly can. Uh, when I think of a successful mission work, I don't often think of how many people were saved or how many people were baptized. I think of how many people in that region have heard the gospel. So if any one of you becomes a missionary, I think one of the, the best things that can be said about you is that after a couple of years in the field, uh, you know, all day that dwelt there <laughs> have heard the gospel. I think that is a, a fantastic sort of a testimony to have. And that is the job of the ministry. Now, uh, although we don't know exactly how the province of Asia Minor was evangelized, uh, it is likely that it is through the means of Paul's quote-unquote Bible college where he would disciple, train, and send them out. And one of the people that would have been sent out uh, as a missionary was a man by the name of Epaphras, and uh, he would have been sent to cities like Colossae, Laodicea, Herapolis, and Lycus River Valley. And now we're going to be introduced to Epaphras. I think, I've, if I'm not wrong, many years ago I preached a sermon on Epaphras. Uh, but Epaphras is a very interesting man. Uh, you know, it's the, uh, the shortened form of Aphrodite, which means lovely or charming. 
and he is introduced to us in Paul's letter to the Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, he was a Colossian, he was a native of Colossae, and he, was he would have taken the road east from Ephesus for the uh, 193 kilometers journey uh, back to his hometown. When Epaphras arrived in Colossae, he immediately began uh, to share the gospel message and to disciple uh, the believers there. Uh, Epaphras also evangelized the nearby larger cities of Laodicea and Herapolis. So Epaphras can be credited with spreading the gospel uh, through much of Asia Minor in a manner consistent uh, with Paul's uh, message uh, and method. So he kind of, you know, that's the beauty of discipleship. Uh, when you learn something, it's easier to apply a method that has already been working than formulate your own method, so to speak. And Epaphras just he did just that. So he's described in many ways. It's very interesting when you notice how Paul describes different people. And I think sometimes we just, what do you call that, uh, go past these, these sort of uh, descriptions and we think it's some sort of term of endearment, that sort of a thing. Uh, but I think it gives us a very good insight into the character itself. He is described as a fellow servant, a servant, a fellow prisoner, and a faithful minister. And, uh, you know, when you think about uh, Epaphras, you can imagine him serving alongside Paul, suffering alongside Paul, and come storm, come rain, come whatever persecution, uh, he would be right there. He is not the kind of fair-weather Christian uh, that is so common these days. Uh, you know, we live in a society where people behave like Christians and they act like Christians when it's convenient to be a Christian, uh, but the moment it is not convenient, we find they start to uh, veer the other way. But Epaphras was not that way. And uh, he sought Paul's advice to combat prevalent heresies. And of course, Paul also had a very great affection uh, for Epaphras. So Epaphras was also the one who informed Paul of the situation in Colossae, which prompted Paul uh, to write his letter to the church there. So it seems that the Colossian believers had adopted some sort of syncretic teaching, and they tried to you know, incorporate Judaism plus paganism and uh, pagan rituals along with Christ. And that's a very scary thing. Uh, and uh, we've got to be very wary of that. Whatever the teaching was, it required a very serious response uh, from Paul. Another thing we know about Epaphras is that he was a giant in prayer. And the scripture says this about him, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I mean, this is a very, you know, a very beautiful thing to say about a, a leader or a, a man of God, is that he's always laboring. It's not sometimes laboring. It's not once in a while laboring. He's constantly laboring uh, fervently in prayers. And uh, his desire and the desire of every man of God ought to be that eventually the uh, believers in his uh, circle grow in maturity and, uh, and uh, grow in that zeal. And he also manifested great zeal for those under his care. And uh, we, we have to understand that uh, this is a time of great uh, spiritual fervor. Uh, today we look at many churches and very few people are concerned about the spiritual welfare of others. We may say we care about it, uh, but uh, we rarely... Uh, agonize about it. I mean, very few of us can say we labor always, you know, uh, for that cause. You know, we can labor to pray for someone if that person has, say, a very a terminal illness. I'm sure all of us labor fervently praying for that person. I'm sure all of us labor fervently praying when someone is sick and so on. Uh, but that is, that is not the, uh, the, the height of, of uh, prayer. Uh, we find we ought to pray for that spiritual maturity. Now, this is the unexcavated location of the city of uh, Colossae. And uh, I know it's like all the others, uh, sometimes you just look at it and it's like, ah, oh, it's just a barren piece of land. Uh, but here is where it all happened. Now, Paul's ministry in Ephesus not only resulted in the expansion of the gospel, uh, but it was also, of course, a demonstration of God's power over the gods and goddesses of the Ephesians. Now, we talked about earlier how the Ephesians worship uh, Diana. And uh, it was, they had a very big temple there. In fact, the, one of the ancient wonders of the world. In fact, even bigger than the, uh, uh, the uh, Parthenon in, in Athens and so on. 
and uh, people would flock there. I mean, today, if, you, if it were in today's terms, it would be like one of those uh, great wonders. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 11 and verse 12, when God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits uh, went, out from the, uh, went out of them. Now, this was a very unique, when the Bible talks about special miracles, now, it's not like he did some miracles that were never heard of before, right? Healings have always taken place in the Bible. Uh, the, in fact, in Jesus' ministry, he raised people from the dead, he gave sight to the blind. So what is meant by the term special miracles, all right? And uh, I think when we talk about special, it's about the way the miracles were done. Uh, instead of Paul having to physically go and lay hands or speak a word, uh, we find that when they, when they took handkerchiefs or aprons from him uh, and they gave it to these people, the spirits or the diseases would leave them. And so today, uh, there are some that try to uh, practice this in Pentecostal churches. I don't know if you believe me, I didn't want to put a video up, but they sell handkerchiefs, all right? And they say these handkerchiefs have been blessed and so on. And uh, people actually spend a good amount of money uh, buying these handkerchiefs and so on, hoping that somehow these handkerchiefs uh, would bring them, uh, you know, would cure them of their diseases. First of all, uh, we're talking about the apostles here, all right? Uh, they were a unique group of men given a unique task. And, uh, you know, I was just talking to my wife yesterday when, when Jesus talked to the disciples about, yeah, the salt of the earth. I was saying, man, there were 12 packets of salt, all right? And boy, did they salt the world. <laughs> you know? I mean, you don't need a lot of salt, but they turned the world upside down, literally. Uh, there were 12 packets of salt. I mean, of course, one was a devil, but nevertheless, uh, there were 12 packets of salt. And uh, these men were unique men. And uh, they were men that... Uh, uh, you know, were given the power to demonstrate uh, the authenticity of their message, and uh, we find that that's exactly what Paul did. So after service, if you want to collect some handkerchiefs from me, no, just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, sometimes I joke with the discipleship group. I say, you know, uh, if you want some holy water at the end, come. No, don't. I'm sorry, I'm on live stream. Like I said, I'm just kidding, by the way. All right, I'm just kidding. We don't believe in such things. And uh, of course, uh, we find that uh, that's what Paul did. The, Paul's ministry involved accompanying signs and wonders was not unusual. What was unusual was the way in which it was done. Now, Asia Minor was known for its worship of uh, Asclepius, the god of healing, and uh, their temples were more like hospitals, all right? Not that they were real hospitals, but they drew people from all over uh, seeking wellness. And uh, what's more, uh, Ephesus was the center of worship, like we said, for Diana or Artemis. And the Greek philosopher Strabo once remarked, Artemis has a name from the fact that she makes people Artemius. The Greek word Artemius means safe and sound. Uh, so people would go all the way to the temple of Diana uh, just so that they would be beneficiaries of the special power of Diana. And they looked at her and uh, at some of these gods as uh, you know, gods of healing. And so when Paul uh, did these miracles, you can imagine the shock uh, of the people there who believe that only this deity uh, can provide that sort of healing. Sometimes you look at the Bible, well, why did God give them the power? Why did God operate the miracles in such a way? It's not for fun. At the end of the day, all of these things was for the purpose of the gospel. All right, and it is not to win, you know, it is not for a show, it is not to exalt Paul or exalt any of the apostles. Uh, it was to point them towards the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And I think today, when you look at the faith healing movement of today, uh, a lot of the times the focal point is the so called miracle worker. And uh, they put the big photo of the guy there and they say, oh, you know, this apostle so and so is coming to town. And I was just talking to one of the young men, uh, I think, was it this week or last week, about uh, the fact that most of it, many of it, much of it, in fact, uh, is all orchestrated and very much a lie. And uh, if you go and watch some of these documentaries, they have people planted and so on. And the things they heal generally is headache and sore throat and that kind of thing. 
and uh, some of these placebo effects. And now, I'm not saying God cannot heal. In this day and age, God is still able to heal. We pray for healing. The pastor is supposed to pray uh, over uh, the sick and so on. Uh, but at the end of the day, we do not hold the gift of healing. If they really had the gift of healing, uh, they would be emptying out the hospitals and all that. All right, so uh, this was the reason why Paul did the miracles he did. In fact, we find inscriptions to Artemis acclaimed her, uh, acclaimed her as a saviour, and she was viewed as having cosmic lordship over the supernatural powers and demons. So you can imagine, people thought that Diana had all these powers, and here comes Paul, and he gives out a handkerchief, and that's it. <laughs> all right. So people would have been mind-blown in that sense, because, like, hey, I thought Diana, this guy is preaching against Diana. He's saying that there's a, a, you know, a, another God. He's saying there's a Savior and so on. And yet, it seems like his miracles are way more effective or, uh, than, than whatever Diana claims to be able to do. And so it would have made a very huge impression on the Ephesians, and it would have resulted in more people putting their faith in Christ. Uh, and and the, as a result, there are about 400 believers in the city during Paul's ministry there. And of course, Paul also exorcised demons in the name of Jesus, uh, Paul's ministry wasn't just a matter of preaching and teaching. It involved engaging in spiritual warfare uh, against the demonic forces at work. Now, let me just say this. Uh, I know in Singapore, probably we don't experience too many demonic activities, uh, well, at least very obviously here and there. But demonic activity is a real thing. By the way, I'll be doing a course in BI very soon on angelology the doctrine of angels, including demons as well, all right? Uh, so we'll be talking about all of that. But angels and demons are real beings. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, when you are in the field, uh, you know, whether you are doing the work of God, I mean, you're, you're, you're a mission worker, a missionary elsewhere, uh, you're not just dealing with individuals. Uh, there is a spiritual battle that is ongoing uh, there are demonic forces that are trying to hinder the word of God, that are trying to keep people unsaved. And uh, Ephesus, of course, they were very famous for their black magic and their magical practices and so on. And when archaeologists dig, you know, in Ephesus, uh, they have found numerous scrolls, amulets and incantations. And today, because they are so numerous and varied, right, they actually call them the Ephesian writings. So you can go and read up about that. I'm not going to spend too much time, but if you go and, and read up on the Ephesian writings, you can type in Ephesian writings, amulets, incantations, and so on. Uh, you will find uh, a lot of these uh, uh, photos of, of all the black magic stuff that they would do or you know, sorcery that they would do. Now, uh, Greek or Roman religions were steeped in a number of superstitions that involved magical incantations to ward off the malevolent spirit, all right? So you have in many regions what they call what, the evil eye and all that sort of a thing, and uh, to ward off bad luck. I know uh, my, my mom used to tell me before about, uh, uh, I don't know, what was it? Was it carrying, uh, you know, the, 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 the unbelievers had some superstition about carrying nails or charcoal or something like that like something like that you know and i was as a kid i would just be laughing about it what you know <laughs> but anyways people do that uh look i'm not trying to mock anyone but what i'm trying to say is that the, these superstitions for the unbelievers are very real and uh, we find the ephesians had that too uh, to ward off uh, spirits and magic magic was used for exorc exorcism by invoking the names of so-called higher spirits or deities. Now, these are some examples of Greco-Roman superstition. One of Greece's earliest poets, Hesiod, advised people to take nothing to eat or to wash with from uncharmed pots, for in them there is mischief. Uh, so even the, the, the food that you cook in pots, you better ensure the pots are charmed, all right? And, uh, but nobody cleans a pot and calls it a day. Theophrastus said that the superstitious man is apt to purify his house frequently, claiming Hecate has bewitched it. 
You know, there was once when I was very young, I went to a store. I did not know what kind of a store it was. Uh, I think it was for Mother's Day or something to buy, like, you know, one of those gemstone things. And as a kid, I thought it was just, uh, uh, you know, a beautiful uh, little stone. And the lady said, can I clean the stone for you? So I thought clean means she's going to wax it or wipe it. And then she put it in a bowl and she started using something and there was a zing, zing, and sound. I said, what are you doing? She says, I'm cleaning it. I said, how is the cleaning? So it's to clean the, the bad spirits of it. I got a shock at that time. But anyways, uh, these are things that people believe. And even in those days, uh, it was practiced. And while many today like, uh, tur like turtles, uh, the author grew up with a plenty in their house, uh, the, in antiquity, the discovery of a tortoise is particularly lucky, for this animal was a bulwark against baneful spells. Uh, so we've got to be very careful uh, about superstitions that have been passed down. I know some of us are first-generation Christians. Uh, you may have been saved quite recently, or maybe you've been saved a while, but you have kind of inherited some of these uh, beliefs from your upbringing and so on. Uh, and I think it's very important not to pass it down to your children. Uh, there is no truth. The only truth we have is the Word of God. And all, all these things are rooted in witchcraft and sorcery. Now, Paul, of course, demonstrated the authority of uh, the Lord Jesus uh, by casting them out without any elaborate incantations. Now, you know, you watch some of these horror films, right? And it seems like the the priest is having a very hard time to get the devil out. He says, oh, the power of Christ compels you. And then, oh, and then he falls back. And then he falls down. And then the de devil falls down. He falls down. When, can you imagine Paul doing that? No. There was no back and forth, jumping up and down, you know, crawling on your legs and arms and, and all such things. Uh, we find that Paul would just command in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that was it. Uh, the demons would flee. Of course, the Lord Jesus himself has told us that some come out only by prayer and fasting, uh, but there is no kind of like what you see in some of these uh, uh, films where, you know, you kind of use some ritual or some, you know, uh, mantra and stuff like that. All these things are not part of what, you know, Paul did in his exorcism. And of course, the power over demons appealed to a group of itinerant Jewish exorcists known as the seven sons of Sceva. Now, the Jews also had their exorcists, all right, just like many other religions do. And this group of people known as the seven sons of Sceva, they basically, their job would be to go from city to city. Uh, of course, at that time, I guess, you know, there were a lot of people that required exorcism and to exercise. And of course, probably they didn't have as high a success rate as Paul. <laughs> probably not much of a success rate, but, you know, he, they would see Paul and they would say, well, let me use his, his magical words as well. And so one of the magical words is, of course, they realized every time Paul cast out a demon, it was not by his own name, uh, but by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they would uh, see a demon-possessed man and he said, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And, uh, uh, you know, they thought that if you say a, a magic word like Jesus, uh, you know, the, the demons would come out. Uh, but Paul's power came from Jesus and not by some magical incantation, you know. At the end of the day, uh, it was uh, the will of God and the power of God. And, of course, the demon, the demon said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And... Uh, with that, they attacked the men, beating them up until they fled naked and in terror. And, uh, you know, I try to picture that scene in my mind. Uh, it is quite a horrific scene, uh, but it would have been such an impression. Uh, God's power is not for sale. Uh, God's name cannot be used as a magical incantation. At the end of the day, uh, God is not mocked. And uh, we find that these unregenerate men, men who are not saved, uh, are trying to fight someone to whom they belong. <laughs> uh, if you are not a child of God, you are a servant of the devil. And uh, it is a very dangerous thing. So when the Jews and Greeks heard about this, they realized the power of Jesus and they regarded his name highly. And many of them would convert to faith in Christ and burn their collections of uh, magical scrolls. The value of the items they burn total about 50,000 pieces of silver coins, uh, which is about four to five million US dollars today. So you can imagine <laughs> the number of, I mean, the economic uh, sort of uh, loss in that sense, you know, 
man, if only why they didn't burn, I can sell on carousel, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but anyways, they didn't even sell it, they burned it. And in short, uh, Paul's ministry began to transform lives and uh, the sale of idols uh, began to decrease. Now, Luke tells us that Paul's ministry in Ephesus continued for two years. And uh, from this point, he began planning his next step around AD 55 or 56. Uh, Paul was determined, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem. So he wanted to revisit the Macedonian cities of Philippi, Thessalonica and Berea, as well as Corinth to take up collections for the poor. And another motivator for returning to Corinth was uh, the delegation he received from the church there. Uh, so we're going to cover this later on, but uh, this is just a, uh, a preemptive uh, slide to show you what's coming up after this. Now this is Ephesus's magnificent theatre. Uh, it's seated about 24,000, and a large portion of it still exists today in the excavated area of the city. And this is the very theatre that the event described in Acts chapter 19 uh, took place. So you can imagine uh, when you read the book of Acts 19, you can put this photo there and kind of be, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very likely that it took place exactly uh, here. So the theatre faced the city harbour and the broad colonnaded Arcadian road led directly from the theatre uh, to the harbour. So you can see the harbour right at the end there. And can you imagine coming from the harbour, you would see the magnificent sight of the theatre. And uh, so it was something that was a, a very a grand and magnificent sight. Now, this is a reconstructive drawing of the Ephesus Theatre in the uh, foreground looking towards the harbour. So, can you imagine, uh, as you sail towards Ephesus, uh, you have a good view of that uh, theatre, or at least from the theatre, you have a good view uh, of the harbour. Alright, this is another reconstructive drawing. So, you've got the harbour and you've got uh, the theatre over there. So, about the same time as Timothy and Erastus departed for Macedonia, uh, the situation in Ephesus suddenly escalated. Uh, the scriptures describes it as no small stir about that way. So the riot in Ephesus is one of the longest and most riveting accounts in the entire book of Acts. Uh, there are some stories like we talked about the Philippian jailer and uh, Lydia and so on, but this is one of the longest and most riveting stories. So you've got a man uh, by the name of Demetrius who is a successful businessman and he is the president of the local tr union all right, of silversmiths. Uh, so he's a man that is, uh, you know, he was greatly bothered by the loss of profit that they were experiencing because of the expansion of Christianity. And you can imagine uh, that this man was doing good business. Why? Because every time a person traveled to get healed by Diana, uh, what would they do? They would buy, a, if you are poor, you buy a small statue of Diana. If you are rich, you buy a big statue of Diana because you want the power of Diana to follow you back home. And so uh, you can imagine this man was not only doing local business, he was an international uh, businessman, all right? He would be exporting and importing Dianas, all right, all around the place. And uh, he is also, of course, in charge of the, the union. And all of a sudden, you have got four to five million books burned. Uh, I mean, four to five million US dollars worth of book burned. People stopped buying as many Dianas as they did before. Uh, production and all that is affected. And, uh, of course, they start to worry, all right? They say, well, if we allow this Paul to continue, uh, first of all, these people are coming here, and instead of going to the temple at Diana, they are taking handkerchiefs from Paul. <laughs> now they burn the books, and finally they're not buying my statues anymore. And so there was a great uh, uh, fear, and, uh, of course, today the, the trade guilds are very similar to the modern-day labor unions, and they were made up of craftsmen from specific skilled trades, all right? So a silversmith is someone who works with silver to make coins, jewelry, sculptures, and other items. And Demetrius specifically made silver shrines uh, for Diana, which were miniature of the temple, all right? So it's kind of like a souvenir kind of thing, a small little temple uh, where Diana would reside. And uh, devotees would place the shrines in the temple as an offering to the goddesses and so on. So he called an assembly of all the other silversmiths to sound the alarm about the impact and the uh, uh, religious and economic impact of Paul's ministry there. Now, there are a couple of, I'm not going to read the entire speech. You can read it in Acts chapter 19. Uh, but Demetrius' speech consisted of four uh, key elements. The first element is the threat to the profitability of the silver craft industry. Uh, obviously, this is the thing that was the greatest motivation. A lot of these folks, whether they really believe in Diana or not, they believe in the money that Diana was bringing in. 
All right? So to them, this was the biggest thing. It's not so much about, oh, my devotion to Diana is so high, I, my heart is breaking because Paul is... No, it was about the money. And of course, uh, they're talking about Paul's influence in Ephesus and almost throughout all Asia. Uh, so you can imagine Paul, by now, is a very, very well-known person uh, in the region. Every city you go to, have you heard of uh, this, you know, uh, faith where Jesus Christ, yeah, I know Paul, I heard about this man, Paul. Have you heard of Paul? You know, he's become such a personality uh, that everywhere he goes, people know him for uh, bringing the gospel. And of course, Paul's critique of idolatry by saying, they be no gods which are made with hands. I mean, today, if you put this sort of thing, they will charge you for what? Intentionally hurting feelings and so on. Uh, but Paul did not mince his words. Now, Look, we make no apologies as a church, uh, and as believers, when we tell a person, we tell them out of love, we mean no intent to hurt their feelings, but when a house is burning down, there is no time to care about feelings, right? You don't say, um, the house is burning down, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, uh, but can you please, no, you shout, you say, get out of there! All right, and so Paul did not mince his words when it came to the gospel. He was not fearful. He went to the epicenter of paganism, and he said, these gods that you claim are gods that are made with hands are not gods. And so first of all, they talk about the economic situation. They talk about the, the, the fame of Paul, and then they talk about the audacity of Paul. And of course, now you have the regular folks, not the businessmen, who are very offended. Wow, he comes to our city, and he dares to say such a statement about our gods, the emotional element is being peaked at this time. And of course, the worry, and then they, they bring in the fear of loss. You know, when you do sales, they always say, at the end, you have the fear of loss, right? So the discount lasts until tonight only. By midnight, there's no more discount, so people start buying. So they say, well, the fear is that the worship of the god Diana or Artemis uh, might be destroyed. And so you've got a very a speech that is distilled into four main points uh, that is enough to stir the minds of the people against Paul. There is an economic issue, there's the influence of Paul, there's the emotional issue, and then there's the fear that their religion is in, in trouble. In Acts chapter 19, verse 28 to 30, the scripture reads, And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would, not ha would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. Uh, so, of course, by this time, the emotions are running high, and they start chanting, Great is Diana. And, um, but there was a lot of confusion. People kind of didn't know what was going on, and they caught uh, two men uh, who were Paul's companions, and uh, they rushed into the theater. Now, Paul wanted to go in as well, but the disciples uh, stopped him from going in. So, after about two hours of rioting, the town clerk uh, or in Greek, the grammatius entered the theater to calm the people down and uh, disperse the mob. Uh, now, the grammatius was the highest-ranking city official of Ephesus, kind of like the mayor or the governor. I know in Singapore, we don't really have that, but uh, in some big states like New York and all that, they have the mayor and so on. Uh, so he was sort of like the, the person in charge of the city, and his job involved... Um, keeping records, overseeing the deposits at the temple, serving as a registrar, drafting and reading decrees, and so on. And it took about two hours before the clerk arrived into the uh, theatre to quell the riot because his office was around the hillside. So if you study the map, uh, it was not too close by. And it's possible that he heard the noise of the riot or one of Paul's uh, Asiak friends sent him a message. So Paul had a lot of friends who were pretty much noblemen, all right, who got saved. And in fact, they also persuaded him not to go into the temple. And it is likely, of, we don't know for sure, that they may have alerted the, uh, the city clerk. Either way, he would have to walk down about two busy streets to get to the theater. Now, this is where we have the next passage of scripture. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. 
Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and they are deputies, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly, for we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed uh, the assembly. So, give me a second. Okay. So basically, uh, what happened here is that he would go down, and uh, his whole argument is this. He says, well, I know that your emotions have been riled up because people are, are very fearful that the worship of Diana is going to be destroyed. But he says, who doesn't know that Ephesus worships Diana? I mean, we've got the biggest temple, all right? Uh, everyone, when they think of Ephesus, they think of Diana. And uh, he's kind of trying to calm them down and tell them, look, this man is not going to change things. At the end of the day, people still think of Ephesus as a Diana-worshipping city uh, or country. Uh, and seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet, for ye have brought these men. Now, first of all, these men that they brought were not robbers. Uh, they were not blasphemers and so on. And so he said, if you have anything against them, uh, well, basically, you know, sue them. <laughs> All right, bring them to civil court and so on. But if you don't stop what you're doing, I mean, if the Romans figure out uh, that there is an unrest, well, of course, I believe the town clerk was worried for his own self. All right, because if there was an uproar and a riot and so on, uh, he himself was in danger of even being up to, you know, the point of being killed, basically. In those days, they don't mess around. You don't just get fired from your job. You get fired, fired. All right, so they, they, they do you away with, and of course, the whole city may be, uh, you know, put through some very rigorous sort of thing. And uh, because of that, they dismiss the assembly. And of course, we see the hand of God in this situation as well, uh, where even with a crowd against Paul, I mean, you're talking about almost the whole city, all right, <laughs> up in arms. When God says they can't touch you, they can't touch you. <laughs> You know, I always say, without God, a banana peel can kill you, right? With God, no one can kill you. I mean, at the end of the day, if God wants you alive, uh, even if the whole country wants you dead, uh, it will not happen. And I remember once again, you remember what happened when he came to Ephesus? God said, well, I have uh, much people, right? And uh, they were not going to be uh, touched. Now, of course, uh, <clears throat> furthermore, uh, so from this point, Paul would leave, and the first place he would go, now this is not recorded in the book of Acts, uh, but from the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 2, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me uh, of the Lord. So we find from Ephesus, Paul would want to go out to Macedonia, uh, but before that, he would stop at Troas, and he says, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Uh, sometimes we go about our lives, we have a plan, we have a place that we want to go to, but along the way, we have a surprise door that is open unto us. And uh, we have to make use of that door. Uh, and we find that Paul was very much sensitive uh, to open doors. Uh, I don't know how many of us are sensitive to the open doors that are available to us, whether it's at our workplace, uh, whether it's at our school. Sometimes uh, you meet an individual and that person is ripe for the picking. All right? And if you do not recognize the open doors that are available, uh, sometimes you find that you miss out on some of these blessings, but Paul nevertheless uh, went to Troas to preach the gospel. All right, and this time, so now that he is done with Ephesus, uh, we know that after he left on his third missionary journey, he made his way to the churches of uh, uh, Phrygia, Galatia, and so on, Iconium, Lystra, uh, Derby, uh, Antioch of Pisidia, and all these places. The reason why we didn't go through them in detail is because we already saw these cities in the first two journeys, so I'm not going to go through them again. But nevertheless, he visited them. He didn't just neglect them. And then he stops at Ephesus, and this is the first time he gets to spend a prolonged period of time in Ephesus, about three years. And from now, he goes back. His intention is to go back to Macedonia. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 1, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed forth to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece 
and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return uh, through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Beria and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derbe and Timotheus and of Asia, Tychius and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Tros, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Tros in five days, uh, where we abode uh, seven days. So when Paul left Ephesus, he made a circuit uh, through Macedonia and Achaia, uh, but Luke mentions it very briefly. So Paul would spend about three months in Corinth, but the total time he spent uh, in this circuit, now we are not sure, but many scholars believe based on the timeline and based on what is said, that it could have been uh, about over a year. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us the specific timeline on this, uh, but it is likely. Uh, during this time, he may have made several trips between Macedonia and Corinth. So you look at the map once again, uh, you see that, you see the, uh, the line from Troas to Philippi, Berea, and so on. So this part here, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, this, this part here was not just one, one trip down, uh, it very well could have been a back and forth sort of a situation. So he would go from Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, you know, Corinth, back up to Thessalonica, Philippi, and so on. It would have sort of been a, a circuit uh, during this time. So Paul had two main purposes for returning through Macedonia and Achaia. First of all, it is to exhort the churches there. And again, that is very important. The part, you know, Paul wasn't just involved in preaching the gospel. One of the biggest part of his ministry was exhorting the uh, churches. And he didn't just, you know, start the church and forget about them. He went back uh, to take up collection for the poor Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Uh, this seems to be always on his mind. And Paul had a very, very firm belief that what they owed spiritually, they could provide for physically. And of course, the Gentile churches had much to be thankful for, for the work started by the church at Jerusalem. And uh, because of that, they owed their eternal salvation. Of course, we all owe it to the Lord, all right? But in some ways, uh, they owe it to the ministry of the churches. So you notice that Paul takes very seriously all these bonds of affection from church to church. And uh, it is the obligation, or rather the... Uh, not obligation, I would say it was, it was only right and fair, all right, for the churches to uh, take up a collection for the Jewish believers. And of course, he also wanted to return to Corinth and rekindle his relationship with the believers there. We know that he was uh, with the believers there for a period of one and a half years in Corinth, right? So he wanted to go back there, and we'll see very soon that he would have problems there. Now, of course, during his years in Ephesus, Paul would receive reports of problems in the Corinthian church. Now, this is very scary. Can you imagine you're a missionary, you're in Corinth, you've started a work, one and a half years of sweat, blood, tears and everything, and then you come to Ephesus and automatically, you know, you start receiving reports on how the church is going into all sorts of uh, immorality and all these sort of things. And so he wrote a letter with many tears. Uh, now, it is said that Paul wrote about three to four letters to the Corinthians two of which are extant, that means still existent and part of the canon of scriptures, and two of which uh, were letters that, uh, uh, sort of, that have been lost, that were not ever meant to be part of the uh, Bible. Some scholars say three, some say four, uh, but we are not certain of the exact number. But based on the, uh, the things written in Corinthians, it seems like there may have been other letters that have been spoken of and so on. So when he was in Macedonia, okay, uh, we are running out of time, but let me try to finish this. When he was in Macedonia, he met up with his co-worker Titus, and the Titus would go up to deliver uh, the letter to the first, uh, known as First Corinthians, and uh, very soon after, he would make a second visit to the city, and he would describe this second visit to the city as coming unto them with heaviness. So Paul never liked to go to a church to rebuke. He never liked to go to a church to put down and to discipline. And I think no pastor or any man of God likes to discipline, <laughs> all right? And it's always a, a tough thing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he did what was necessary, and uh, he 
did not shy away from rebuke and exhortation uh, where he had to. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop because we're going to do a survey or we're going to run a video next week on 1 Corinthians. We're going to talk about 2 Corinthians. Now, over the next couple of weeks, as we go towards the end of the third missionary journey and we go on to Paul's imprisonment in Rome and all that sort of a thing, we are going to do a little bit more of a, uh, what you would call a, a survey of some of the books written at this time. Uh, it is a good time to chart the map where these books were written and all that. And if we have more time, instead of playing you a video, I will do the survey myself uh, just to spend a bit more time on some of the books. Uh, but in any case, we'll continue on the uh, books of Corinthians uh, next week. All right, are there any questions at this time? If not, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Most High God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life of Paul. Help us, Lord, uh, take to heart the things we've learned. Uh, I pray for the service to come, that you will be with me, that you will be with the people. Uh, that uh, the words that I bring forth, Lord, will bring glory to Thee and impact the hearts and minds of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, folks. <clears throat>